Welcome. I'm Ann Sterling, your host for Director's Cut New Mexico, brought to you by Friends of Film, Video, and the Arts. In this segment, we bring you the art of storytelling in documentaries. Successful documentary filmmakers and screenwriters from New Mexico share their process for taking a great idea and making it into a compelling story. You'll hear about the similarities and the differences between the storytelling process in a documentary and storytelling in a feature film, where the script defines the story before the process of filming even begins. Join our guests, Mark Calderwood, R.C. Chapa, Michael Kamens, Dale Kruzik, Christopher Schuler, and Beverly Singer, as they share their thoughts, insights, and strategies for storytelling in documentaries. It's like, you know, something from the universe just whacks you upside the head and says, that's a good story. For me, a documentary has to be about the truth. I joke around it from time to time. I say we're making the world a better place one documentary at a time. I really believe that. I don't want to change people. I just want, you know, with my work, I want to just uh, open their eyes. Documentary is so much fun. I get so excited about it, especially in terms of the storytelling of it. My documentary approach is I do get involved with the lives that I begin to discover and get to know. The most passionate part of, of making documentaries um, is really going into somebody's world and finding out what it is and then putting that story together and sharing it, putting it out there. If you can actually have an impact on somebody's view and maybe make them a little uh, more open to what's going on in the world instead of their tendency to maybe just think they have it all figured out, if you can, if you can alter that in some way, I think that's, that's what drives me. Yeah, I don't want to change people. I just want, you know, with my work, I want to just uh, open their eyes a little bit more. There was a very conscious effort on the part of Bureau of Indian Affairs people to go out into the reservations to recruit Indian people to go to urban centers. Uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, Minneapolis, and so on. The Native people were recruited into lower level training situations like hairdressing, mechanics, welding, etc. And these, of course, are very tenuous kinds of occupations. I think you really have to believe in what you're doing. I joke around it from time to time. I say we're making the world a better place one documentary at a time. I really believe that. And I think it's really important that people with authentic voices are out there sharing themselves and having the rest of the world somehow get, a, get an insight into what they're believing in and thinking about because it makes us better human beings and I hope makes the world a better place. Once we were atop the small mountain, we could see for over a hundred miles in all directions, the landscape of Andres' homeland and of his history. He detailed how the land had nurtured his people. He emphasized that as one of the last undisturbed areas of the valley, it must be protected. The first step was simply convincing people that the spare wild territory was sacred. And it was at this moment I determined to share my friend's legacy of that land in hopes of keeping it vital, undisturbed, and intact. For me um, and my work, I mean, I have an agenda. I'm a documentarian who has a social agenda. So my topics, teen suicide, mental health stigma, domestic violence, gambling addiction. I mean, all these different social issue kinds of things. Um, I have an agenda to educate the public and also to move them into some sort of political action, ultimately. Something we need to contend with as a community. And I think uh, if once more the communities can come together and say, okay, this all fits together, we need to take care of our youth, our children, this is what we need to do, I think we're moving in the right direction. We didn't have television when I was growing up until I was about maybe 10 or 11. So, we really did spend a lot of time in conversation around the kitchen table. And aunts and uncles, grandparents would come over, we go to their house, and they would be sitting around, I was this little kid, and they'd just be talking all this stuff all night long, and I was like, and i just take it in. And I think that's where my idea of what great stories were about, when people laughed and people cried and people kind of left feeling like you belonged. We've always told our legends, our stories, our creation stories, 
how we ended up here on Nopi as Wampanoag people. Uh, so those stories have been passed down. Um, our leader was um, a giant man by the name of Mashup, and he came here with his entire family, um, his wife, Squant, and his four, um, excuse me, his 12 uh, sons and 12 daughters. So how do you know when you've got a story, something that you can develop into a film and tell in a compelling way? For our documentarians, it is primarily an intuitive process. Let's hear from them. At some point, you have to be able to intuit it. You have to be able to know, aha, that's, you know, it's, it's kind of like I'm, I'm sure you're going to ask, you know, what's the hook? Okay, it's the same. I'm sorry, I stole that question right out of your mouth, didn't I? It's the same thing. You know, the hook is the aha. It's like, you know, something from the universe just whacks you upside the head and says, that's a good story. That has to be told. There's the inspiration part, and that's, for me, that's the first stage, and that is you, you believe in something, you meet somebody, uh, you hear about a great story that you think everybody should know about. So that very first stage is, for me, is that inspiration. You kind of have an instinct for what is, and it's not that difficult to know what is a good story or, or, or what is not, at least for me it isn't. It's not any tangible thing that I can say, now I know I have a story, because I've done so many different kinds of documentaries. Having worked for PBS for, for many years, I would get folks calling me about good stories, and um, I would talk to them a little bit about what the story was about and would determine right away whether that was a story that I could develop. One that I did choose to develop was about the um, Japanese petrochemical plant that wanted to come into a community. Um, I knew it was a good story when, um, after talking to the woman who was the leader of this advocacy group in the community, told me that 75% of the people in the community had cancer. The children already, without this new plant coming in, had to sleep with those um, masks at night, oxygen masks. 75% of the children had asthma. And so this was a, an incredible story that nobody was telling, and I thought, wow, this is unbelievable. When does the story itself show up in the process? I mean, even if you have a great topic, stories don't just happen. They have to be crafted. So where should you start? What pre-production do you do? Do you write a script like you would in producing a narrative movie or write your treatment and start shooting? What do documentary filmmakers need to be thinking about as they go about the process of creating that story? It seems that some of our documentary filmmakers start with a clear plan, while others have a general plan and let it evolve. As a screenwriter, when you're writing narrative, you write the screenplay first. And when you're making a documentary piece, you look to write the, the um, treatment first. The interviews may change the story. I never write a documentary before I've done the interviews. So um, once all of that is done, then I begin to write my script. And then once the script is done, I go through several drafts, and then I have a final draft, and then I begin editing, and then have a few drafts of that, and then I complete the film. Documentary, doc, documentary is so much fun. I get so excited about it, especially in terms of the storytelling of it, because um, in the best of all possible worlds, as you do a documentary, you, you research, you do an incredible amount of research, you do an incredible amount of sort of sifting through not only information, but people who can give you that information because they will be the storytellers for you in a documentary. I don't write the story. They write the story. So you have to find those key people to tell the story for you. And then I've got this stack of transcripts and in there is the story. And I've got to find that story. It's the same thing in terms of building a story, is that it's getting to the meat of it, the content, cutting it up, opening it up, the guts up, and seeing what's, you know, all of the stuff there and letting it kind of ooze, you know, and then putting it together. It's got its own little heartbeat, and it's got its own kind of, um, kind of energies, you know, and how you can pull that together in terms of really getting to the source, the source of what it's about, you know. And sometimes what we end up doing is talking all around it, you know, as opposed to just jumping in, you know, either with head first, feet first, whatever, and getting dirty and muddy. 
you know, <laughs> with the story. <laughs> and that's when it, when I know that I'm in it is when it's starting to feel uncomfortable or it's starting to get messy and it's like the characters are starting to act out and things aren't like working and it's like, wow, you know, then you know that something has really started to take shape and mold. My documentary approach is I do get involved with the lives that I begin to discover and get to know. And, I, and I'm interested in them, you know, beyond just having their, you know, their, their wisdom. You know, it's about also having shared in their life. And I think that that's the difference between any of this other television or, or fictional filmmaking is that, you know, it's, uh, it's a very suspended, temporary, artificial um, truth that we're at. But when you're, I think, a true documentarian, you live those lives. You are a part of it and they're a part of you. And they continue after that. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't stop at that point. I know I've talked to the right person when that person is impassioned and is articulate and can tell the story that I'm looking for. In documentaries, your film is all about, you've got, you've got a narrative spine, but then you also have to have the interview. The Poncho Sanchez film was going to have a narrative but as I was writing the script, it just wasn't coming together. So I wanted Poncho to be the narrative spine. He was the one who had to tell the story. This used to be my house. I remember this post. I used to go into my home, this right through in here. My house was right here. If someone has something they need to share, I want them to share it. And when it just comes from the heart, it seems to be so much more effective and honest. The people who have the most to share or say are the most unassuming people that you would imagine. It's not the extroverts, it's not the folks who dress funny or whatever. It's people who are just simply themselves. And how do you find people who are just themselves? It's, you know, people on the street or whatever, but I think it's more than that. I think it's like people who are actually living their lives, people who are doing things, people who are farmers, people who are, you know, musicians, people who are creating things, you know, who've created a life themselves and have not paid attention to what everybody else is doing, but have followed their own path. The story will be there and you can find it. So what we do first is a series of think tanks. We bring in people who have any kind of tangential interest or, or expertise in that topic. So we determine, okay, there are four major issues that we have to cover here. We have to make sure we touch on A, B, C, and D. How can we best touch on those? Mm -hmm. And then we start looking at the story. Who can, in fact, in the documentary, tell that story the best? The people we selected were based upon, one, their story. Was it passionate? Was it riveting? Was it something that people would go, wow, I want to know more about that? Could these people appear on camera and do okay? Um, and then, would the viewing audience connect to these people? You can't invent the story. You pretty much have to stick to the facts. Getting at the truth of a story is, to me, what documentary has always meant. A lot of people do write, docu write their script before they actually start shooting, but I just, I just don't like to be restricted by a script. I've known people who have gotten very angry about being told what to say. That's how you make someone uncomfortable. Well, did I say that the way you wanted me to say it? And if you've got people doing this, then you don't have, <laughs> you can't use it. So um, I think it's really important that you let people say what they want to say. I like talking to people. And as I said, I like listening. But I'm always listening, as I said, for those seeds of truth that people have, because I feel like all the documentary programs I've worked on, projects, they have all had the same sort of thread of looking for the voice of women, the voice of children, the voice of healing, the voice of recovering, you know, sort of the human spirit of the reasons why we were peopled, you know, for the earth. And so that all my documentary pro projects sort of have that element in it. You want to tell a good story, you want to tell an authentic story, you want to tell a story that's true. I want to tell a story that's true to the person that I'm working with or the, or the topic I'm working with. That's very, very important. When does a project become a compelling story after shooting hours of tape with talking heads and location shots? We've heard that a story can be planned or it can evolve through a process of discovery. Some filmmakers 
treat the process as a giant jigsaw puzzle, creating all the pieces and waiting for the whole picture to be revealed. In every case, an essential element of successful documentary filmmaking is a good story structure. So what is a good story structure? And what role does editing play in creating that structure? The danger of just going out to do a documentary on a subject and you line, you talk to all these people and you line up these interviews and uh, you shoot, you know, <laughs> 50 interviews and you, and you get back to the shop and you sit down and start logging and you think, my God, you know, what do I really have here? I mean, if it's just driven by the fact that you want to put a bunch of smart people on camera and they talk about what they know, um, it can be a really difficult process. For the writers out there, for the people that are interested in writing, I think that they really need to study structure. You intuit a good story, but you really have to understand story technique uh, and process and structure to then make that palatable to the public. It's a process of finding your central character, your main character, and then the second piece of that is what do they want? Okay, uh, and not only what do they want, how are they going to go about getting it? What are the decisions they're going to make as they go about getting it? What are the things that are going to happen to them as they go about getting it? And who's creating that conflict? What you do with that central character past that is what makes the story. And it makes the story in both feature film and many documentaries. Everything has to have some conflict in March of the Penguins which is, um, I bring up because it's, it's relatively recent and it was a smash hit. The tension mounts as we're following these little tuxedo people around, you know. Uh, not because there's a bad guy that beats up some of the penguins, you know, or not because there's somebody that runs roughshod over them, but because the elements that they're in creates conflict and, and because they're cute and they're cuddly and we, they look like little tuxedoed people. And at particular moments, the conflict was heightened. It's an 80 minute documentary. And at minute 40, which was halfway through, exactly halfway through, and the bitterest storm hits and all the penguins are huddling together. They put that in at 40 minutes because we still have 40 minutes to go and we need a highly dramatic moment right now. That's what you can do with documentary to develop story. If you, if you watch March of the Penguins and you take a stopwatch, you will see that every five minutes, something significant happens. On five minutes to the minute, they leave the ocean and begin their walk. At five minutes to the minute, they get to that little home base. At five minutes to the minute, the eggs are hatched. They find each other and the eggs are hatched. At five minutes to the minute, the fathers leave, the mothers leave. In feature film, you find the same thing. Everything happens on a beat process. And those are the beats that happen in a story. In terms of the points that you have to deal with, I mean, you have this, this initial part that is the introduction. You meet the characters. I mean, this sounds like screenwriting. You meet the characters. You understand the dramatic conflict within the characters. Um, then you have, you have the development of that conflict. You have the, uh, the climax. And then you have the denouement at the end. And there are plot points, as any good screenwriter will tell you. And those plot points have got to hook in to the storyline and shift it into a different direction. And they happen at specific points, you know, seven pages in, 21 pages in, all the different things. And all the screenwriters are now going, oh, that's right. Do you do that for documentaries? Yes, you do it in a different way because you allow the people who you have interviewed to do those elements. People that look like overnight successes have generally spent an enormous amount of time and energy learning their craft. And that's when that becomes an art is that they get past the craft part and they know it well. And I see a lot of young writers, and, and this goes for documentary storytellers tellers and narrative storytellers, understand that it's all structure. That once you, once you got the structure, you can go on from there and you can do anything you want. You can turn that, you can take act one and put it behind act two, and you can take act three and put it over here, and you can do the reversal over here and all that, all that other crap, you know, you can do it. But the brilliant people that are doing that aren't just doing it willy-nilly. They understand the structure in storytelling.
And whether it's documentary or narrative, you got to understand it. I'm right out of the narrative playbook. Um, I think having the beats and the, the, the pacing, all of that is about telling a good story. And there's a rhythm that the audience is used to, so you play along with that. Godfrey Reggio loves to do that. He understands, even though he thinks technology is what's ruining uh, you know, our place on the earth, he still understands how to use those vocabularies in order to get his message across. And so I'm very keen on those vocabularies and certainly the stuff that comes out of narrative filmmaking. That dramatic storyline arc is right there that everybody keys into, so why not use it? I know that we've had to really re-edit um, a documentary many times. I mean, where you get to the point, first cut, second cut, and you realize that the arc is just like not in the right place. You know? I have a pretty good example of where it could be misplaced. And Kiss My Wheels, when Miguel and I submitted the first cut to PBS, the critique that came back was the arc is way off. And at first we, we, we thought, well, this is ridiculous. I mean, it's fine. But at that particular point in the story, um, what follows after the arc, just, it just went on for too long. The whole idea of an arc is it's a transformation at some point in the story where, where you know, there's a change. And, and so that's a good example of where we had to go back and recut. And we were happy that we got that feedback because I think it helped. I think it made it a better story. It's putting a puzzle together. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think all of documentary production is putting a puzzle together. It is, in my mind, in the producer's mind, I kind of have a feel, after all the pre-production, what the thing's going to look like. Then what we do is have to create a puzzle. And we make all the little pieces, and then we have to figure out how to put them together to create this show. It's going to be riveting, important, something the viewer can relate to, and will use somewhere down the road. So why should documentary filmmakers go to all this trouble thinking about an arc or beats or creating drama and resolution? Isn't it enough just to have an interesting topic? The defining characteristics are the same for documentary and film, I think, in terms of those, those moments. And the reason that's important, I think, is you have got to hold your audience. Mm -hmm. It's a show. You're not doing this to show your friend and you two are the only ones who are going to see it. You're not doing this just for your family. You're doing this because you want an audience to view what you have done. Now, you have got to then keep the audience interested. So there are storytelling elements, and it's the very basic storytelling elements, to make the viewer stay with you, to engage the viewer in some fashion. And that is a crucial issue that I think sometimes gets lost along the way. But you've got to do good TV. You've got to do good film. Or nobody's going to watch. And the point is to have people watch. I do like fast. And I think that audiences want fast. They're compelled to sit in their seats when you give them something compelling to look at. They get up and leave when you've done one or two things. You have not entertained them or you've lied to them. I try to make whatever I do very user friendly so it's not too confusing. Um, but now I've, I've sort of gained a reputation for, uh, for getting at people's hearts and emotions. And, and many of the documentaries I've done, the, there's always the, you know, there was not a dry eye in the place. It's kind of the things people say after they've seen my interviews. And it's really important that, that I touch the audience one way or another so that the story means something to them. If they're not moved, then um, I don't think I've reached them. I would say that science likes to be objective, you know, so I'm not going in there as a scientist. <laughs> I'm going in there as a human person uh, with a desire to, to share stories. I'm for trying to explore the human nature. How do I engage an overall audience? Well, yeah, there is a, a, an approach there. And I think it maybe goes back to story structure. Mm -hmm. I think it also goes back to really great photography. Really great sound. I think sound's more important than photography. And I think multiple levels of sound make pictures have dimension. Um, but those are all kind of the, the, the things that cascade down that are part of an overall concept to making something engage an audience. 
I don't think I'm making documentaries for myself. I'm not interested in, in an audience of one. Our filmmakers have shared with us their creative processes for storytelling, from pre-production to getting muddy with the story, getting to the heart of the story and the storyteller, to finally putting the puzzle pieces together and weaving it into a story through editing. The art of storytelling and documentary, it seems, comes from how the filmmaker chooses to weave those elements together, paying attention to engaging content, story structure, and to touching our humanity. Thank you for joining us this edition of Director's Cut New Mexico. I'm independent filmmaker, Ann Sterling. Just cut. Okay, that's it.